whoever I retweeted this off of said this, like, this is why they don't invite trans people onto panels, like, onto the news very often, because we're very matter-of-fact, and we're like, here's the actual realistic situation, and it's not that scary, and, and it's just like, oh, well, we'll see what happens next, you know? But no, like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything for safe spaces. So we talked about pretty recently that there was a reform to the Gender Recognition Act that passed in Scotland, where very particularly in Scotland, they decided to just just change a couple of things about it, like how, what age you could apply to get your gender changed legally, and a couple things like that. Just kind of making it a little bit easier for people in Scotland to get this done. Scotland is a part of the broader UK, there is like a there's like a whole CGP Grey video about what the difference is between like England and Great Britain and the United Kingdom. That's not something that I really understand very well, but there is a distinction and like Scotland is part of the UK. So when we're talking about the UK's Gender Recognition Act and the process by which you get a gender recognition certificate, Scotland's laws are under the purview of England just in the same way that the state laws in the United States are still subject to the federal jurisdiction. Like the if the if the federal law trumps the state law, like you can't make state laws that counteract that. You know what I mean? Like I barely understand it and I'm from the UK. Yeah, no, it's it's not fun. By the way, if you're here and you've not hit like, definitely hit the like button. Also, if you're here and you've never donated before, this is my actual job. Consider dropping me a $5 dono over on the website. You can do a subscription on the website, which will get you access to some custom emojis. You cannot give me any super chats because YouTube takes 30% of your money as opposed to direct support through the website. You can also consider pitching me a dollar on Patreon. That's like $12 a year or something, which is not a lot, but it's helpful for sure. I guess we'll just go over really quickly. This is what happened. Uh, the UK government blocks Scotland's new gender recognition law. It was a majority, I think, that passed it for sure. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a close vote. It was like eighty-six to thirty or something like that. The vote that passed this reform to make it a little bit easier. I think the main thing that that the law changed with Scotland was removing the fact that you needed a gender dysphoria diagnosis, which currently in the UK they are deliberately restricting access to gender clinics they're they're slowing down the process bureaucratically there are several different gender clinics and like here's how it works in the uk they have specific clinics just for gender stuff we don't really have that in the us you kind of just go to a different like general doctor to get your care but like they have let's just say four i think that there may be more than that but let's just say four different gender clinics across the whole country and those clinics are specifically designed to provide only this kind of care. And then across the whole country in a given month, they're only seeing about 50 first time patients with four dedicated clinics. You could see 50 first time patients at one clinic in like one week. It might be only first time appointments that week, but whenever, like I've seen photos of people saying I'm sitting in the waiting room at the gender identity clinic and here's the waiting room and then just a photo of a completely empty waiting room. So it's not like they're really stacking appointments. It seems like they're deliberately bureaucratically slowing down the process. And yes, Philosophy Tube did a fantastic video about this. It was very, very informative and Philosophy Tube retweets things on Twitter that also help bring attention to this a little bit. It's kind of a nightmare over there. They've been deliberately bureaucratically slowing that process down. So that's just for a first for a first appointment. There's like 5,000 people on the waiting list and they're only seeing 50 people a month for their first appointment across the whole country. That's 5,000 people waiting for their first appointment. Then you have to actually go to the clinic multiple times in order to definitely have your gender diagnosis. Like you might not get it the first time you go. Hopefully you know all the right things to say and you'll get it, but like you might not get it the very first time you go. And then you have to have the permission from your doctor to go apply for a gender recognition clinic or sorry, for a gender recognition certificate. So what the GRC does, the only thing that it does 
is it allows you to change your birth certificate, the sex on your birth certificate, your wedding certificate if you get married, and your death certificate if you die. It doesn't change whether you access bathrooms or anything like that. But in the in the England part of the UK, they've been very strictly saying, no, you for sure have to have this diagnosis, which could take you five years to get. You're on a wait list that could last years and years and years and years and years. And yeah, so you can't get married during that time and have your accurate, you know, have be accurately recorded as the bride or the groom respectively. It's a big pain in the ass. So the Scotland just wanted to make it easier. They just wanted to say, hey, let's take off this gender dysphoria requirement and and like make it a little bit easier for people. And this might be the thing that destroys the United Kingdom as we understand it. So here we have, yeah, the UK government blocking Scotland's new gender recognition law. The UK government blocked a new law intended to allow trans people in Scotland to change their their legal gender without medical diagnosis. Scotland's first minister called this intervention a, quote, full frontal attack on our democratically elected Scottish parliament and its ability to make its own decisions on devolved matters. This is that fascism that we've been talking about where the democratic process says, yes, we support trans rights, but the minority who is in higher central power can use outside forces in order to change this, uh, in order to change and block the democratic process. The minister representing Scotland within the UK government announced Monday that Westminster had taken the highly unusual step of blocking the Scottish bill from becoming law because it was concerned about its impact on UK wide equality laws. Um, so what's in the Scottish law? It just makes it easier to change your legal gender. Under the current system, they must, uh, trans people have to jump through a lot of hoops. They have to have a medical diagnosis and they also have to be at least 18 years old. So the new rules just drop the medical diagnosis requirement. The waiting time would be cut from two years to six months and the age limit has been lowered to 16. Oh, yeah. oh chat. Thank you for the $5 dono, dono Salander Sal Sal says. A uh, $5 dono says, cheers to a UK split because Scotland said trans rights. True. I mean, honestly, if they, if this is what destroys the United Kingdom, I mean, I would be pretty proud of us. I will be pretty proud of us if this is the thing that single-handedly destroys the United Kingdom. Scotland has been better off without England for years. They deserve a split. They do. They deserve independence for sure. And Ireland as well. We can make it happen. That that Star Trek episode uh, where it's like the oh the Irish reunification of 2024. We can do it. We can do it. I believe in you. So why did Scotland want to change the rules? Campaigners have long argued that the current process is overly bureaucratic, expensive, and intrusive. There were big consultations held on the issue, public consultations. We think that trans people should not have to go through a process that can be demeaning, intrusive, distressing, and stressful in order to be legalized in their lived gender, said the government when proposing the new rules. In the end, a substantial majority of Scottish lawmakers from across the political spectrum voted in favor of the change last month, the final tally being 86 for and 39 against. This passed with bipartisan support. Which, you know, in, in America, that, wow, like, that's saying a lot because of the distinction between Democrats and Republicans. But yeah, no, this, this, conservatives and more liberal types were both on board with this. The reaction in Scotland was that the bill sparked emotional reaction on both sides. The debate over the proposal was one of the longest, most heated in the story. In the history of the Scottish Parliament, the final vote had to be postponed after the session was interrupted by, pro by protesters shouting, shame on you at the lawmakers. That's what we discussed before about the lady flashing a Merkin. And she did it in the most pussy way possible. I didn't fully know until afterwards. She was wearing tights, like she was wearing hose. And then she glued the Merkin onto the hose. So she wanted to simulate like she was flashing parliament, but she wanted to do it within very specific what she assumed, I, I guess, was like legally acceptable parameters where she wasn't actually flashing her real junk because she was wearing hose. Many human rights and equality organizations and campaigners welcomed these new rules pointing to a growing number of democratic countries where self-determination is the norm. The bill attracted huge amounts of criticism. Of course, JK Rowling complaining about it. This 
people opposing this bill argued that it could weaken the protection of spaces that are designed to make women feel safe, such as women-only shelters, even though you don't have to produce a birth certificate in order to go to a women's shelter or a bathroom. Here, let's do this really quick. Hold on. We have this other thing open. Let's do it. This is it. Just you, you mentioned safe spaces and the safeguarding of women is often raised as a factor in the speed of, of self-identification. You know, why do you think it doesn't have any impact on um, safe spaces? Well, I'd ask you the question. When was the last time you needed to show your birth certificate when you went to the toilet? Yeah, never. Yeah, exactly. You, you just don't you just don't do it. Nobody asks you for your birth certificate. Um, or a gender recognition certificate or any other kind of documentation when you go to the loo or when you go to single sex changing rooms or to any uh, any other space like that. So you're saying you could use uh, single sex toilets anyway and this just changes a formal piece of paper. That's what you're saying. That's, that's correct, yes. OK, well, we'll see what happens next but uh, and see how far the UK government takes it. Just We'll see what happens next. Like, this is... What did the person say? The person who retweeted this said... Uh, uh, whoever I retweeted this off of said this, like, this is why they don't invite trans people onto panels, like, onto the news very often, because we're very matter-of-fact, and we're like, here's the actual realistic situation, and it's not that scary, and, and it's just like, oh, well, we'll see what happens next, you know? But no, like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything for safe spaces. I don't even think that that lady understood that she was being asked a question initially, like the trans woman was like, well, let me just ask you, like, did you like, have you ever had to provide a birth certificate when you're going to use the loo? No. It's like, yeah, because we don't do that. It's crazy. Even in the United States, people do this where they're like, like, ah, how dare you use the bathrooms? Like, it's like it has been legal the entire time. It's actually been legal the entire time for anyone to use any bathroom because gendered segregated spaces like that aren't legally protected. A private institution might say, this is our men's locker room, this is our women's locker room, and have an individual policy of some kind, but it's never been explicitly illegal for just any old man to walk into the women's bathroom and piss there. If a man walks into the women's bathroom by mistake and pisses in the women's bathroom, it's not illegal. And it's just been recently that people have tried to make it illegal. So why is the UK government getting involved? You know, Scottish government rejected the argument that it's that it's making women only shelters dangerous. Yeah, the laws don't change the rules on who can use uh, single sex spaces. So yeah, why again is the UK government getting involved? Scot Scotland has a devolved government, which was established in 1999, which means that many but not all decisions are made by the Scottish Parliament in Holyrood, Edinburgh. The Scots can pass their own laws on issues like healthcare, education, and environment, while the UK Parliament in Westminster remains in charge of issues including defense, national security, migration, and foreign policy. So the UK government can stop certain Scottish bills from becoming laws, only in very specific cases. For example, if the UK government believes that the Scottish bill would be incompatible with any international agreements or with the interests of defense and national security, or if it believes that the bill would clash with the UK-wide law on an issue that falls outside Scotland's powers. It's like, okay, with, with regard to healthcare, I mean, education and environment, the UK Parliament is in charge of defense, national security, migration, and foreign policy. This, like, when it comes to what is required to change your documentation, at least in the United States, like, and maybe this is a very United States-centric position, but it depends on your locality. I don't understand, you know, the national government has never stepped in and said, you can't change the sex on your birth certificate unless you have sterilizing surgery done. That kind of stuff is left up to the locality. So it would make sense to me that the UK government, like, would not be involved in the updating of documents in the locality of Scotland, which is under their general purview. This feels like government overreach for sure. <clears throat> Again, I'm just speaking as an American on that. So under the rules that set out how Scotland is governed, London has four weeks to review a bill after it's passed by Holyrood, after which it is sent to the King for Royal Assent, which is the last formal step that needs to happen before that law becomes law. The deadline for intervention on the new gender bill was set to expire later this week. But in, many in Scotland have accused the UK government of playing politics and blocking the new bill for political rather than, rather than constitutional reasons.
quote, whatever your view on the bill, people vote in Scottish Parliament elections thinking they're electing the MSPs who will represent and legislate for them on devolved matters, said Emma Roddick, a Scottish Parliament lawmaker. Sunak, who is the Prime Minister of the UK, has demonstrated what the SNP has said for decades. That's only true as long as Westminster wants it. Wants it. Two-thirds majority in favor of a bill within devolved competence, uh, and then Tories we didn't elect want to strike it down for political reasons. This is intensely frustrating. Like, I cannot even imagine how frustrating this is. The UK government's argument on this is saying that the bill would impact UK-wide equalities legislation. The power over gender recognition laws is devolved to Scotland's government, but legislating governing equality is set by Westminster. The bill would have a significant impact on, amongst other things, Great Britain-wide equalities matters in Scotland, England, and Wales. I have concluded, therefore, that blocking it is the necessary and correct course of action. Who said Who said that? That was Jack someone? I don't know. Doesn't really matter. But advocates disagree with this choice. The rights group Transactual told CNN in a statement that it saw, quote, no justification for the UK government's decision to block the bill over concern for UK-wide equality laws. Quote, there is no justification for this action by Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack. He will lose any case brought by the Scottish government because the Equality Act is 100% independent of the Gender Recognition Act, and nothing in the Scottish bill changes that, said Helen Belcher, the chair of Transactual. Quote, trans people have never needed gender recognition to be protected by the Equality Act. That's really interesting. I don't really know a lot about the Equality Act versus the Gender Recognition Act, but... I am getting the impression that the GRA isn't part of the Equality Act, that you're protected by the Equality Act whether or not you have a GRC. And that's all the GRA governs is whether or not you can get a gender recognition certificate. But anyway, so the Scottish government is not allowed to overrule this decision. If it wants to take the legislation forward, there are two options, which is amending the bill bringing it back to the Scottish Parliament, or challenging the UK government in court, which is not going to go well, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We're hoping to find a constructive way forward if the Scottish government decided to make changes to the law and present it again. However, that seems unlikely. Sturgeon said in a tweet on Monday that her government would, quote, defend the legislation and stand up for Scotland's Parliament. So I'm seeing this going to the High Court. There's no precedent for this because the UK government has never before used this power to block Scottish legislation in this way. Quote, this is the first time the power has been exercised, and I acknowledge that this is a significant decision, says Alistair Jack. We should be clear that this is absolutely not about the United Kingdom government being able to veto Scottish Parliament legislation whenever it chooses, as some, ha as some have implied. That's exactly what it is. The political background, yeah, the anti-trans culture wars. Do we have any info about Rishi Sunak in particular here? Yeah, so this is just kind of going into, like, some of the tensions between the UK, like, uh, the broader UK and Scotland in particular. Like, Scotland voted to remain in the European Union, and Britain voted no, like, you know, nah, yeah, don't worry, Flynn, no worries, no worries whatsoever. Britain's Supreme Court ruled in November that the Scottish government cannot unilaterally hold a second independence referendum. Yeah, the SNP is vo is pushing for a new independence vote, but the UK government has said it will not agree to one. It's yeah, no, you never they never want to like lose control over their territories. That's never going to be how it works. I think that Scotland is going to have to violently re like revolt if they want to end up out of the control of the UK. So honestly, it kind of seems like the UK's refusal to acknowledge Scottish rights to to amend the gender recognition process in their jurisdiction this might be the thing that destroys the european not the european union but the united kingdom like the the fact that they have been so intertwined for such a long time like they might earnestly like this might be the thing that destroys scotland being part of the uk we're not totally sure like they keep wanting to have a vote for independence they didn't want to leave the european union and they had no choice because they're part of the fucking uk government like I think people in Scotland are pissed off. So, but it's not, it doesn't end there because there are other things about trans healthcare in the UK that are brewing. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, the way that it works in the UK is you get on a, you, you go to your, you go to your regular doctor and you say, I need specialist care for gender stuff. 
and they say, okay, I'll refer you to the gender specialist clinic. And there's like four of those clinics or so. And you get put on a wait list for a first appointment because there are lots of people who also want to get their first appointment and, and go over whether or not they have a gender dysphoria diagnosis applicable to them. So that's how that is working currently. The way that it's supposed to work, as I understand it, the legal requirement, and I learned this from Philosophy Tube, so if I have it wrong, it's because she taught me wrong. <laughs> um, they have a legal requirement for if you go to your GP, your general practitioner, you go to your regular doctor, and you need like dermatological care or something like that, you're like, I have cystic acne and I really need some specialist care for this uh, cystic acne. And they say, okay, cool, I'm just a GP, so I don't really handle cystic acne, so I'm gonna refer you to a dermatologist. Legally, you have the right to be seen by that dermatologist within 18 weeks, which is like about four months. It's a little bit more than four months. And that's like the legal requirement. You are required, you have the right, you have the right to be seen within that 18 week time frame, And what's happening with trans healthcare is very obviously falling outside of that range in like pretty dramatic ways. You know, if you're 15 years old and you've just realized that you're trans and you wanna get on puberty blockers to prevent your breasts from growing more than they already have, like you, you need that care soon. You need that care within that four months. And if you don't get it within that four months, like that is a big issue. And, and like, you know, that's not getting into the separate problem where a teenager usually ages off of the list. Like they're, they're waiting for so long while they're a teenager that then they turn 18 and then they have to start all over at the very bottom of the wait list for adults. It's a horrendous, very, very, very fucked up situation that they've been dealing with. And Abigail was talking in her video on Philosophy Tube about the difficulty she was experiencing with getting an investigation going. And the reason why it was hard to get any info and to like get an investigation into this bureaucratic nonsense going is because there was a court case kind of in the process of being litigated. It takes a long time. You challenge something in the lower courts and then it gradually goes to the high court. So what ended up happening is, so they have a high court in the UK that's kind of like the Supreme Court in the United States, where we have like, I have a state Supreme Court, and if I don't like the outcome of the case in the state Supreme Court, I can go to the appellate courts, the appeal courts, which is which is like sort of a district where my state is is part of a district of several other states. It's a slightly higher court. And then if I don't like the decision of the appellate court, I could potentially take my case all the way up to the Supreme Court, which is when you get judgments about like Roe v. Wade and stuff like that. So similarly in the UK, you have the high court and trans people lost this case that was basically saying there is a legal right for people to receive and non-emergency care. We're specifically talking about non-emergency care. You have the right to receive non-emergency medical care within 18 weeks of your initial referral, the first day you go to your doctor and you say, excuse me, I'd like to be seen for ch trans care, they're supposed to send a letter over to the gender identity clinic and then that wait time starts then. And people are waiting for three years, for five years, for longer. But apparently the high court has decided that this is not illegal, that this is not, this does not represent a refusal or a failure to provide the rights that the person are supposed to be uh, able to have there. <clears throat> I don't know that this article goes into the why very closely. And so I might end up getting kind of irritated while looking at this uh, because I don't, yeah, I don't think that this really went into the, the why. So if anybody has a link that could go into that a little bit more in depth, please send that to me. Yeah, exactly. It's literally we investigated ourselves and determined we did nothing wrong. My quote unquote four month wait ended up being three years and people are waiting even longer than me. And that's for the first appointment. And they won't even diagnose me with dysphoria for another eight months. And then that doesn't even include the wait list to actually get on hormones. 
They deliberately drag out the process. This is very similar to crisis pregnancy centers in the United States, where you go to someone thinking that they might be able to help you get an abortion, and then they just string you along until you can't legally get an abortion anymore. Like then you're eight months pregnant and there's nothing you can do. So yeah, let's get back in here. A group of trans people have lost their legal case against the NHS uh, England over waiting times. Uh, two trans adults and two trans children had tried to get the wait times, which are more than four years in one of their cases, deemed illegal. They just, they are illegal. I don't know why you have to deem it illegal. The high court ruled that the waiting times are lawful. So the judge dismissed the claim on several grounds. Justice Chamberlain said it was, quote, important to acknowledge the serious effects of long waiting times on the first two claimants, referring to the two children who were awaiting treatment ahead of puberty. Quote, their distress and fear, as described by their parents, is particularly affecting because its source lies in their own changing bodies. It is a matter of great regret that many other children and adolescents waiting for children's gender identity development services must face the same distress and fear. The question for me, however, is not whether the first two claimants and others in a similar position have been well served by NHSE, but whether NHSE is in breach of the legal duty imposed. So among the claimants in the case was a girl, a trans girl, and yeah, we have a little bit of details about that. Her father says, as her body develops into a man's body, she is becoming increasingly distressed and sad. Her father is concerned that she will have lifelong mental health issues without access to treatment, preventing these changes. Strong and important case. Uh, gender here is explaining what gender dysphoria is. As of August 2022, there were more than 26,000 adults waiting for a first appointment. I didn't know that the numbers were so high. 90% uh, of whom had been waiting for more than 18 weeks, according to the court judgment. The judge concluded that the duty on the NHS was, quote, a duty to make arrangements with a view to ensuring that the 18-week standard is met. But crucially, that it, quote, does not regard failure to achieve that standard as a breach. I haven't read the law, so I can't say whether that's fucking retarded. But if you live in the UK, can you tell me? Can you just tell me if that's fucking retarded with how, like, the law is actually written? Because the way that Abigail made it sound in her video was that everyone has the right to this standard of care. And, like, I don't think, I don't really think that there was, that they have met, if they do have, if the only duty that the NHS has is a duty to make arrangements with a view to ensuring that that standard is met. They're also not meeting that standard for sure. If this, if it's supposed to be a four month wait and you end up waiting four years, you have fucked up dramatically. You have failed in your duty. People are dying. You have failed in your safeguarding duty. Mr. Justice Chamberlain also looked at the claim of direct discrimination, which is the argument that waiting times were longer in gender identity services than other parts of NHS England because of discrimination. But he listed the reasons for the long waiting times in gender identity services, saying that it was down to increased demand, recent clinical controversy surrounding the treatment, the difficulty in recruiting enough specialists despite having funding, and the need to redesign the commissioning model. Just fucking let people go through their GP or get referred to an endocrinologist rather than a gender identity specialist. Like, what the fuck? Quote, on the contrary, as I have said, the evidence shows that the long waiting times have increased despite NHSC's willingness to increase very substantially the resources available for this service area. I, I'm so upset right now. Like, I cannot imagine waking up in the UK to this news this week. Like, I can't fucking imagine. I am so upset by this and I don't even live there. Like, this is one of the very few times that I'm like, I'm glad I live in the United States because at the very minimum, we have an extremely decentralized medical system. And while I hate private insurance, it also means that we do have opportunities for like sliding scale clinics. We have Planned Parenthoods. We can have private clinics that allow people to get this care. Like, this is so fucked up. The Good Law Project also said that it and the trans community were disappointed. Good Law Project assesses with great care whether to take on a case, and we believed it was a strong and important case to bring. It's our first loss in this space, having previously brought two successful cases, and we have decided to appeal this decision. 
So I guess it's good. Like, I guess it, instead, as opposed to the high court, like, uh, sorry, as opposed to the Supreme Court here, you like where you can't really appeal a decision past the Supreme Court, I guess the high court that this was seen in does have the opportunity for appeal. NHS England, which has opened four new gender dysphoria clinics for adults within the last two years. They've also closed a couple, though. Keep that in mind. The NHS notes today's judgment, which saw the claim dismissed on all grounds and acknowledges steps already being taken to reduce waiting times for gender health care services. Which steps? Yeah, I mean, that's the question. What steps are being taken? You're vaguely saying steps are being taken. This is exactly what Natalie was, or not Natalie, what Abigail was saying about non-performative speech, where like the, almost like the act of saying the thing is preventing the thing from happening. Like saying, we have taken steps to ensure that, and it's like by saying that you're basically guaranteeing that nothing's going to happen. It's like being on the fucking phone trying to get assistance for four hours on repeat, having a fucking robot tell you like, we care very much about your call only to have the call dropped after four hours. Like, yeah, there's nothing that makes me feel like you care I'm mixing up my mommies. There's nothing that makes me think feel like you care about my call more than being repeatedly told by a robot that you care so much about my call only to have the call dropped for no fucking reason after four hours. Like this kind of bureaucratic slow down bullshit is intended to wear you down. You know, there is nothing you as an individual can do. And there's not even apparently very much as a group you can do. This was four, excuse me, four trans people all suing the UK government together. And the judge just said like, nope, it's not illegal. Yeah, to wear you down and bleed you dry of any ability to act. You're out there, yeah, you're bleeding out and they're like, we are taking steps to get you medical attention. Meanwhile, you've been waiting for hours. I just, at a certain point, there's nothing you can say because anything that I could think to say is gonna be TOS. Like there's just no, like, do you want Guy Fox? Because this is how you get Guy Fox. You know what I mean? Like this, this is how you create the situation where people like lose all faith in the institutions. I refuse to kill myself over this. I'll get my tea even if I have to wait 30 years. I'm so sorry, Flynn. Like I, I cannot imagine how upsetting this situation is. I thought I heard sometimes if you let your doctor know that you will DIY HRT, they'll speed up the official process for you. I don't think that that's a guarantee. I think that they're supposed to, but at the, uh, there are new rules actually in the UK. We've covered this on stream before as well. I'll see if I can find a link. Um, there are rules in the UK about if, if you are getting DIY hormones as a teenager or potentially under these new changes that were proposed, I actually don't know if the, I don't think these have gone through yet, but this guidance was suggested and may yet go through where they were like, yeah, if you're doing DIY as a teenager or if you're getting it from a private clinic, not through the NHS, uh, we might initiate safeguarding procedures. And safeguarding procedures is, I don't know if it's really clearly outlined, but typically it involves the, uh, it typically means the involvement of social workers, uh, medical providers, and police. So if you're a teenager and you do DIY and you t tell your doctor, that you're on DIY, they might initiate safeguarding procedures. I mean, you can give advice to trans women, I guess, in the chat, she who knows no name. That's the thing that's frustrating about DIY anyway, is in the, in the UK, and I even think in the United States, you can get estrogen and it's, it's in like a legal gray area or like it's not explicitly illegal to obtain it or to share it. In the United States, I think it's illegal to share. If you're prescribed a medicine, I think it's illegal to share it with someone. But if you just buy it online and it's not a prescription, I don't think it matters. But, it, you know, you can get estrogen and you can get testosterone blockers, but you can't get testosterone that way. In the United States, it's a felony to obtain testosterone through unofficial means. Yeah, you cannot DIY as a person who needs testosterone without committing a felony. Like you could do it hypothetically. I am not gonna say that I support you doing it. You would be committing a felony, but I'm like, just because things are illegal doesn't mean people aren't gonna do them if it's absolutely necessary. So then you're creating another avenue by which to criminalize trans people. 
It's also much more dangerous than it would be for E. Yeah, if you get if you get your testosterone off the black market for sure, you know, like if someone has a legitimate prescription and has access to safe testosterone through their pharmacy and they break the law to give their tea to someone else, that would be a safe way to do it. It would also be illegal. So yeah, is there a fund people can donate to to pay for trans people's health care and needed prescriptions? I don't think that there's a centralized way to do that. I can't say that there's a centralized way to provide this health care. I think that it's just, it's it tends to be just individual people's GoFundMes and stuff like that. But yeah, I don't have a whole, t a whole lot to add to this. This is horrific. And I feel so bad for everybody in the UK because you don't, it's not like in the United States where... If your local clinic doesn't want to provide you with care, you know, it might be a huge pain in the ass to drive three hours, but that's what I did. When I first got testosterone, I just drove three hours to the nearest clinic that I knew was a was an informed consent clinic that wouldn't require me to go through months and months and months of therapy. So, yeah, um, I, I feel terrible for them, and I think that you know, one of the only things that we can really do is try to fund people getting private health care because you can, you you know, the NHS isn't the only way to get health care in the UK. So I will say that the the National Health Care Service is not the only avenue to get health care, but it is paid for by your taxes and it is supposed to be free. So if you do like, I, you know, I don't know if their taxes are actually higher, but hypothetically, your taxes might be a little bit higher there, depending on how much they spend on their military. Actually, our taxes might still be... We might pay more taxes and get less out of it than anybody else, including people in the UK, even with how gutted the NHS is right now. So the NHS is not the only way to get health care. It's just expensive. You're paying taxes for the NHS, whether you're using it or not. And then, like, it's it's... Any amount of money that you're spending on private health care is money you weren't planning on spending. So I think that that makes things a little bit more difficult. We're going to have to just try to get people money when they're when they're on these long waiting lists or. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of solutions. Just my heart goes out for sure. Happy New Year and thank you to all of my viewers and especially my patrons and especially these ones. Tiago Nascimento. Mersh Rolvog, Jovian F. Gaudreau, Bean, Heather Clarkson, Amanda B., R. Halverson, Athiet, Sarah A., Michelle Winter, Wellington Marcus, Suzanne Maynard, Nova, Mr. Atheist, and Elizabeth Bartell.